thank you for the opportunity to, to talk here to uh, Earth Observation uh, Community uh, from the ground-based uh, forest inventories perspective. And uh, yeah, I, I work here as Professor of European Forest Resources, both at the Wageningen Environmental Research and at, uh, partly at the university as well. So the material I will show is certainly not only my own uh, work, but uh, luckily we have a team of, uh, of very nice people, very active, and also a lot of young and new people nowadays, which, which we are very happy. So we work on European forest resource analysis, um, selection, so tree selection work, provenances, uh, you know, managing uh, better forests, let's put it like that. The National Forest Inventory is there, the NFI. We also have Dutch pilots. Pilots on climate change, testing new species, new management principles under climate change. So we're also rather closely uh, attached to the European forest sector, NGOs, uh, represent representative organizations. We do work on carbon projections, carbon and climate, um, but also, uh, well, the, the LULUCF will mean something for you. Yeah. Land use, land use change and forestry uh, analysis. And the reporting to the UN we do, and uh, of course, a lot of it related to EU projects. Um, well, a little bit about myself. In 1995, I started my PhD. And uh, well, it started with being on the landline phone for more than a year, gathering data from countries. At that time, there were international statistics. So countries were reporting to FAO, but usually only one number for, for a, a variable for one, one number per country. But we needed more detailed data, and there was no joint and harmonized collection. And the only way to get there was calling countries. We had an address book. I had an address book with some addresses of institutes. I, I just started calling. And uh, it took almost a, more than a year, almost a year to find the right person and the right data and willingness also to send the data. And they used to send it on a floppy disk. So nothing about 25 terabytes per day. It was one floppy disk in half a year. That's, uh, that's only, it's not that long ago, only 27 years ago. Anyway, a little, that was a bit of history. Uh, I'll say something about NFIs, the National Forest Inventories in Europe. I don't think you're very familiar with it. Some of the challenges of gathering those data from 27 or 28 countries in a harmonized way. I will make one uh, example of the Cecherini paper. I'll explain it later why an, an Earth observation and ground-based uh, interpretation of, of these, uh, these data. And say something about uh, hopefully some step forwards. NFIs, um, well, National Forest Inventories. The, the first ones in Europe were established around 1910 already. At that time, there was a, a large shortage of wood in Europe. There was by far not as much forest in, in Europe at that time than what we see now around us. So people wanted to have insights in how the forests were developing, especially for wood uh, provision. You know, how much wood will be available in the future? That was a big question. So. It, Usually an inventory is set up in the following way. For the area assessment, aerial photographs are used over which uh, then a sample uh, design. I don't find this very uh, handy. Uh, a sample design. And on every sample point, field crews go there and measure the diameters of trees in, in the most basic form. So uh, you see a picture from the 1920s from Finland. And basically that's still done the very much the same. So field crews go there every five years. And this is institutionalized in a lot of EU countries, but nowadays also in many more countries, the US, Canada, where you, you see the list there. In Europe, there are some 420,000 to 500,000 plots where field crews go every five to 10 years. In principle, this is very accurate, and it has to be very accurate because forests are a, a long living and long developing system. So small changes which you can detect only if you measure very accurately will have long-term implications. And you need to detect the small changes. Because you need to imagine there's an enormous stock of wood in Europe and it only changes one or two percent per year. So you need to detect that change. And it's not about the coverage as such, but it's the stock in wood which you need to detect. And this is why you need to measure on the ground. 
Um, well, most EU countries actually started much later with this. So this is uh, some idea for the, for the Netherlands. Uh, the sample design, the Netherlands has roughly 3,000 plots where crews go every five years. But for example, fin Finland has 51,000 plots, Germany 54,000, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see, well, this is a, a close colleague who has worked with me for, uh, for 20, 25 years, Matt Jan. Uh, it's, you know, we sometimes say it's a three trillion trees and, and still counting. Um, so these national forest inventories, they are gathered with public money. It's, it's all funded by public money, but all the data are not publicly available. And that is a, a big challenge there. There are also other disadvantages. These long cycles of measuring, plus a couple of years of delay before the data are actually released, make that the data are already seven years old by the time they, they are being released. So nowadays, that's not suitable anymore. <clears throat> the data are often combined with relatively old growth functions in order to make a, a bit of a, a growth uh, correction. So that also relies on old data. Um, and then there is a process from these raw data and these many plots into still these international statistics. And that process is very intransparent. It's absolutely not a scientific process that others can check. Only some countries are very transparent about it, but many are not transparent about it. So nobody can actually check. And another thing is these raw data, they are only used in, in one or two small groups. They're not used widely, and only few countries are very open with the raw data. So this is the state now. There's an incredible amount of data being gathered, many plots, many other uh, uh, schemes. The ICP is another scheme over Europe with, with inventory plots. I can say that, inventory plots. There's a long-term ecosystem research network. There's the ICOS. There's some other networks that, that have experimental sites. There's a lot of reserves that are being monitored, a lot of provenance trials that are being monitored. <laughs> the amount of data is, is really incredible. So these NFIs, as I said, they tend to be rather slow and they're not fulfilling the needs anymore, not like in the 1910s and the 1920s. These disturbances in Europe, you may have heard about the bark beetle disturbances in, in Central Europe. Uh, these disturbances are developing very fast. Climate change is leading to fast changes. Uh, the policy reporting tends to be more closer even to, to near real time, preferably annual or even shorter. There's a lot of new regulations being set up, the biodiversity regulation, the restoration regulation, even a monitoring regulation is, is being developed. So there are more and more needs and more and more variables that, uh, that are being uh, asked for. And this is, a, this is a big challenge for the national forest inventories to keep up with that. And they're actually, they're not really able to keep up and they really need to make the link to the, to the earth observation as well. So this is, uh, if we now want to gather all these data from across the countries, and this is basically what we, we did then in, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we gathered these semi-aggregated data. So they're pretty detailed, but, but, uh, but not at the individual tree level. And with this, we can make projections across Europe reasonably uh, detailed. For example, this is one outcome is the the forest harvesting intensity, how much of the increment are you harvesting in the different regions? And we can project that with the AFISAM model into the future. So it's resource projections. It says a bit about biodiversity in terms of age of your forest, dead wood, et cetera. Uh, but certainly also it has a full carbon balance uh, uh, part as well. So this is then the, the kind of things that we're able to do and the kind of projections or well, this is a more historical uh, analysis of how increment in Europe has developed over time. It has really increased a lot from around 450 million cubic meters in the 50s and 60s to 800, 900 million cubic meters nowadays. Much, much faster growth nowadays and the, the harvesting level has increased as well, but, but by far not as much. And this difference between these two lines is the sink in the forest every year. 
And this kind of uh, things we, we were able to do as well, based on, on the early collections of plots which we had. Uh, roughly, uh, then we, we gradually started to move to ask for the individual plot data. We were able to make these three species maps uh, and, and a more detailed resource analysis. Um, well, you, you may, uh, the light green, I don't know if you know all the species, the light green is a lot of spruce in Central Europe. The dark green is uh, Scots pine here in the, in the northern uh, Central European plains, the sandy plains. You can just recognize the Veluwe, where we are close here now. The oaks in, uh, in France, uh, what do we have? Eucalyptus, this yellow here in, in Portugal, cork oak in Portugal. So this, this variety of management uh, and cultural historical setting uh, is certainly there. Now what were those, those challenges when we gathered data from across Europe? One of the things is that well, forest is not a competence of the EU. The EU has competence on agriculture, on energy, on, on, on climate, uh, on biodiversity, but not on forest. So countries are not obliged to send data to the EU. And this, so this, this sovereign entity of forest has really been exploited by the countries up until now. Uh, so this has really hampered trying to set up very good and detailed ground-based databases in, in Europe. There has been an NFI network for 25 years, and they really tried to harmonize methods and, and methodologies, but that has been very, very slow. NFIs tend to be very conservative. Once you have your measurement protocol, you don't change it because that will make your data in, uh, incomparable in, in, uh, between, in, in, in between the years. There has been a cumbersome relation between the countries and the European Commission, a lot of mistrust, partly because of this point one, um, partly because of also personal monopoly sitting on the data has really played a role in, in, uh, in some of the member states. This has really led to a very cumbersome relation and huge difficulties in, in getting harmonized detailed data. Uh, the JRC did work a lot together with the NFI network, setting out tenders to them, and then the NFI network had to deliver a product. But very often those products were not satisfactory to the, to the JRC. For example, they delivered after a three-year tender, this is what is called a basal area map. The basal says something, let's say, density of the forest across Europe. So after three year tender and hundreds of thousands of the, the NFI network has the hands on the raw data, they deliver a map with, with two vague green colors at a, a resolution of 50 by 50 kilometers. So totally useless. With all those data, this is the best they managed to produce. So when you can imagine this is a, it's been a cumbersome uh, relation. Um, well, I must say we in, in Wageningen together also with the European Forest Institute, we have been reasonably been able to obtain raw data, always on a personal basis and with data agreements. And then for research projects, it is possible to get such, uh, such data. Ah, sorry. Yep. All right. Was that already a long time? Uh, no, oh, oh. One example of uh, trying to combine earth observation and ground-based data um, was this Cecherini paper, also an example of a cumbersome relation between the uh, European Commission and, uh, and the member states. I don't know if you know it, but in 2020, uh, the JRC published uh, this paper, Abrupt Increases in Harvested Forest Area over Europe after 2015. And it said, uh, it came as a total surprise, I must say, to all the countries. Usually these manuscripts, uh, they, they leak and, and such, but this came as a total surprise. And they said, well, harvest has increased in a few years' time, 69%. You know, 69%. And then we all, we all said, this is not possible. If, from a practical point of view, if you are already harvesting 500 million cubic meters, and you need to add 69% in a few years' time, 
you need a lot of people in the field and in the forest and a lot of machines to do that. So we, we said this is not possible. So we, we analyzed that paper and, uh, uh, and more than a year later, finally Nature published our response concerns about these reported harvests. Uh, I'm the last author there. Um, there were serious flaws in, in that paper. There were a number of flaws and I will uh, only point at one, they used a remote sensing product that's not consistent over time. So they actually relied very heavily on the Global Forest Watch product and used that. And we analyzed that the Global Forest Watch product has a spike after 2015. And that appeared to be when we analyzed it and, and, and we're in touch also with Potapov is an artifact of the Global Forest Watch product. The algorithm had changed around 2015, which was not documented. So these cover changes, the cover laws, you see is in many regions in the world, there is a, a sudden increase, even here. It was not only in Europe, but this is <clears throat> what the JRC somehow did not realize or did not analyze or was not in touch with the Global Forest Watch group about it. And this is actually what caused the main conclusion of the Cecherini paper, this, this algorithm change. So there, there has been an increase in the harvesting in Europe, certainly since, uh, since the uh, economic recession, but not the 69%. So we, we analyzed that and also found that they had not really uh, canceled out disturbances, which they claimed they did. And there were some, some statements of, about the bioeconomy as well. So it was a lot of, gave a lot of hassle. Um, but it also has further global implications because this spike is, is everywhere. The Harris et al. paper, the 2015-16, uh, what is this, is cover gross emissions. Uh, the New York Declaration on Forests also has it. So this, this is also, uh, you know, one, one algorithm change, and this is the risky part of, of Earth observation data. And if you don't know exactly what's happening on the ground, or don't want to have it checked by countries, then this is a very risky uh, operation. That's maybe the, the, the message that I want to give. Steps forward. Well, this is what we, we now, since 2006, have managed to gather uh, NFI plot data, some 192,000 points. These are points with individual trees, and this will allow us to do higher resolution modeling. With this, we can project the resource much more detailed on the climate sensitive, we managed to develop uh, management strategies maps out of this based on if you have remeasured plots, then you know what each owner is doing. This is, this is very valuable. Then you know which tree they took out, which trees are dying, what is happening on the climate change. You can analyze all of that. So this may, makes it into a hugely valuable data set. And this is one example. This is a, uh, I think it's 10 or is it one by one kilometer resolution? With efficient space now, we can make these high resolution uh, carbon modeling. In this case, it's the net biome production uh, for a number of years based on this, uh, these detailed data. We want to further develop this in, uh, in, in various respects. So, uh, in growth will come in, harvest of wood products, we can connect it now to the industry as well. Um, some of the soil carbon need, will be improved. So this is uh, possible now. But I, I must acknowledge we are, still, we, we are still very weak in connecting this earth observation with the ground-based data. The small inventory plots make this uh, very uh, highly challenging. The group in Florence with Gerardo Chirici and in Umia now with Ruben Valbuena and uh, Saverio Francini, we will, uh, they have started improving the algorithms analyzing the Landsat, so making Better algorithms locally or regionally specific will improve the interpretation of these Landsat series. So it says something about the latest disturbances, the greatest disturbance, and, and the depth of the disturbance as well, being able to distinguish thinnings from final fellings in a better way. And this is one of the things we want to do in a recently awarded this forwards project, also Horizon Europe, that wants to, con wants to set the basis for a European observatory for a uh, for forest is uh, this is led by Ruben uh, Valbuena here, and this is what we we want to uh, step uh, make big steps in the future. Okay, we this is the last one. We're making steps now. 
these improved Landsat algorithms will make a difference. So we were quite certain about that. So I pointed at, at the, the, the sort of the standalone interpretation of Earth observation data and the risks that may be in there. Um, we will always need a good set of ground-based data. Um, things are improving. More and more EU countries are, tend to be very open with the raw data. That's, that's very good. There's a big difference. It's quite a difference from the, from the phone uh, times. Um, and the last point, which is something that you may want to see. Last week, the Dutch 7th NFI was released. It was uh, quite big news in, in the Netherlands. Uh, the colleagues really managed to, to get the news attention. And all raw checked data are available immediately, as it should be, across Europe. And there's a very nice uh, release film on, uh, on YouTube. If you want to learn something about how inventories are done, it's really, really nice. Thank you. <laughs>500,000 plots being measured, so it can never expand to that. But uh, it. That's right, and that's certainly right, and uh, they will complement it, I, I think. We, we have a uh, hundred of them since 2007 in the Netherlands automated dendrometers, but still the ones where you have to go to download. There are now indeed new ones which, which uh, transfer the data. Um, they are much more costly, but they're certainly very good for, to complement the inventories. Oh, okay. But exact yeah, exact locations. That's right. That's, that's a very good point. The, all these, uh, even the countries that, that do make the raw plot data available, they slightly jigger the location. And that's a, that is indeed a, a big problem. How much? Five meter, meter? We, we don't know. It varies per country. And it, it might be a few hundred meters. It might be, uh, yeah, even less. If somebody mentioned privacy reasons, what's the privacy? Privacy for trees? Yeah, I, I do believe some of the NFIs are hiding behind privacy reasons. Because all that you would release is that there are, for example, 20 oak trees of 20 centimeters at that location. You're not disclosing who the owner is and or how much that owner, he or she has. I do believe NFIs are hiding a bit behind privacy re uh, re regulations. We have, and it doesn't look like that is going to change very quickly. There are some of the NFIs are willing then on a personal agreement to also give you the exact location. But then it will only be for one project, or one analysis. Okay, I think we have still time for one more question. Um, so let's go. This has three votes. Um, are you the 192? Are the 192,000 yeah. <laughs> observations you used um, for publications you presented openly available? <laughs> I had expected that question. <laughs> um, some of it is, yeah. Some of the countries have these uh, these data, these plot and tree data, freely available on the internet. Uh, Spain, France, Germany, Netherlands, uh, one or two more coming. So those are certainly freely available. The others, uh, we we are not. We have obtained them with a data agreement. We are not allowed to to transfer the data to others, but we can certainly give you the the data contact, and then you can contact him or her. That is possible. Fantastic. Thank you so much.